Okay. My name is Heather Service, Project Manager for the National Clearinghouse of Rehabilitation Training Materials, NCRTM. And welcome to this event sponsored by the National Clearinghouse of Rehabilitation Training Materials in collaboration with the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation, also known as CSAVR, for this Lunch and Learn event. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a white woman with straight brown hair, blue eyes, and glasses. I'm wearing a purple blazer and a gray shirt. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. First, we are recording today's event session, so please be sure to mute your microphones. If you would like to use live captioning, go to your meeting controls and select more options or the ellipsis icon, also known as the three dots. Then turn on live captions. To stop using live captions, go to the meeting controls and select more options, then select turn off live captions. If you are using a sign language interpreter, you can pin their video on your screen so it's always visible regardless of who is talking. To pin, select the video labeled ASL interpreter and select pin. Please note that as content is shared, you may need to reselect the ASL interpreter window to make them visible. If during today's event you require any technical assistance, please use the chat feature or email us at ncrtm at neweditions.net. To kick off this event, I would like to turn the event over to Kristen Reinhardt Fernandez, RSA Project Officer, Project Manager, and System Owner for the NCRTM. Kristen? Thanks, Heather. My name is Kristen Reinhardt Fernandez. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am Caucasian with dark brown hair and dark brown eyes. I am wearing a cream blouse and a camel color blazer. Welcome OSIN staff and rehabilitation long-term training grantees. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you to our valued collaborative partner, CSABR, for planning and coordinating this event with RSA's National Clearinghouse of Rehabilitation Training Materials. The CSABR Operations and Personnel Committee and the Human Resource Committee assisted with outreach, as well as planning and coordinating this event. CSABR was also key in supporting RSA and engaging Dr. Herbert throughout the planning process. I would also like to extend a very warm thank you to my colleagues in RSA, Dr. Herbert, today's panelists, and especially to Heather Service and the team at New Editions for their incredible hard work in today's event. Now I will turn things over to Karina Stiles, Director of the Training and Service Programs Division in the Rehabilitation Services Administration. Karina. Thank you, Kristen. I am delighted to be here and welcome everyone to this exciting event hosted by the NCRTM in collaboration with CSABR, the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation. I'm really delighted that uh, so many of you have joined us today to discuss the critical issue of recruitment and retention of state and tribal VR rehabilitation counselors, a topic that directly affects the rehabilitation program and quality of services provided to individuals with disabilities. We all know that VR counselors play a pivotal role in helping individuals with disabilities realize their full potential, achieve competitive integrated employment, and carry out the mission of the Rehabilitation Services Administration and the Vocational Rehabilitation Program. To position the VR program for success for many years to come, it is critical that we understand and leverage lessons learned to inform, innovate, and evolve the long-term training program in order to meet the critical needs of individuals with disabilities. And we believe this is a shared responsibility and a collective mission that should organically bring together a multitude of stakeholders. Since 1954, the Rehabilitation Long-Term Training Program has supported academic training grants to colleges and universities with undergraduate and graduate programs in the field of ER. The program serves a critical purpose of increasing the supply of qualified personnel in the public rehabilitation sector, which includes state federal vocational rehabilitation programs and tribal vocational rehabilitation programs. The program also maintains and upgrades the skills and knowledge of VR personnel, ensuring that they have opportunities to stay up to date on the needs of the field. 
The success of the long-term training program definitely lies within the ability to forge powerful partnerships and collaborations. And grant recipients under the program are required to build closer relationships between training institutions and state and tribal VR agencies to promote careers in VR, to identify potential employers who would meet a scholar's payback requirements, and to ensure that data on the employment of trainees and scholars are accurate. So by joining forces and harnessing our collective expertise, I believe we can improve this landscape and elevate the profession of rehabilitation counseling for the future. So today's discussion transcends the immediate challenges that we face. It's really a call to action to radically reimagine VR counselor approaches to hiring, retaining, and advancing the rehabilitation counseling professionals. We must guarantee the profession not only survives, but thrives, continuously adapting to meet the ever-evolving needs of individuals with disabilities in this dynamic and ever-changing modern workplace. Skilled rehabilitation counselors elevate the profession and profoundly impact the lives of individuals with disabilities. I also would like to thank Kristen Reinhardt and the TSPD team for pulling together this very timely and critical lunch and learn session today. And thank you to Heather Cervais and the NCRTM team for providing stellar contract support on all things NCRTM. And thank you to Dr. James Herbert for being an ally in this effort and your willingness to share your findings from your important VR counselor study. And thank you to the states of Texas, Georgia, and Mississippi for sharing your experiences later today during the panel discussion. Your dedication and commitment to this important mission are deeply appreciated. So I hope everyone on the call today enjoys the event. And with that, I will turn it back to Kristen Reinhardt Fernandez. Thank you, Karina. And we'll be hearing from Karina at the end of today's event to help us close out. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, Carol Pankow. Carol is the project director for the George Washington University team on the Vocational Rehabilitation Technical Assistance Center for Quality Management, otherwise known as VRTAC-QM. As a former state director of Minnesota Blind and most recently assistant commissioner with Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, Carol brings over three decades of professional experience in working with the disability community. Carol holds a master's degree in management of rehabilitation services from DePaul University in Chicago and a BS from Mankato State University. Carol benefited from our the RSA Scholars Program with her degree from DePaul back in 1994. Carol also served as president of the National Council of State Agencies for the Blind and committee chair of the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation, or CSADR. Carol, take it away. Thank you, Kristen. I am super excited to be part of this event today. This topic has been near and dear to my heart for a long time. I used to be the old Human Resources Development Committee Chair for CSAVR, and we started looking into this issue of recruitment and retention years ago. This was back like in 2016, and I was able to get hooked up with Dr. Herbert um, through our collaboration with CSAVR and the new Operations and Personnel Committee. At the VRTAC QM, we actually have started a pilot project with four states about this issue of recruitment and retention. So this discussion today is so incredibly important. And our first guest, Dr. Jim Herbert, or Jim as I'm gonna call him throughout the session, I got to know Jim this past summer as we recorded two different podcasts on the Manager Minute about his research. Jim's a professor of counselor education and rehabilitation and human services at Penn State. Jim's research interests include clinical supervision practices used in vocational rehabilitation settings, strategies to facilitate career development and job placement of persons with disabilities, the long-term effectiveness of rehabilitation counselor training, which we're gonna talk about today, and post-secondary outcomes of students with disabilities. And so you are all in for a huge treat as Jim unpacks this really cool research. 
So Jim, over to you, my friend. All right. Nothing like sort of setting you right up there, right? Hey, I am very excited to be here. Um, and as Carol said, my name's Jim Herbert. Um, I am a principal investigator of a NIDR study, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But for uh, those of you, um, uh, so we can just be all inclusive, on the first slide is uh, information about uh, my back, um, the name of the study and contact information. Um, on the right hand side, there's a picture of me. I'm an older white guy um, who uh, uses the pronouns of he and him. Um, I have silver hair, kind of a round beach ball kind of a head, <laughs> trim beard. Um, I'm, I'm smiling in the, in the camera. I'm wearing a dark, the picture shows I'm wearing a dark blue jacket and a light purple shirt. I'm looking happy. I'm looking stylish, <clears throat> at least in my mind. Um, today I got dressed up. I put on a tie for you folks. Um, usually uh, I reserve that for special occasions, so this is one. OK, so next slide, Madison. OK, so what's going to happen uh, this afternoon for about 25, 30 minutes? Um, we're going to look at strategies that address recruitment and retention. We're going to allow five to ten minutes of time for uh, for you guys to ask questions. And I we have 56 people, I think, on board. And as I scan the chat, I see a number of old friends, uh, so even some former students. So that's always fun to see that. Um, we'll then have a panel discussion that will further unpack this presentation and and they will offer their reactions and comments to some of the points that I'm making and then we'll close it with some remarks from RSA and CSABR. Next slide. <clears throat> the other thing I should say, I'm struggling a little bit with a cold, so I have a little bit of a hack, I apologize. So let me just kind of talk a little bit about the, the background of this work. We know uh, historically and certainly within the last 10 years, there's been a critical shortage of state folk rehab counselors. And um, being committed to that mission here at Penn State, we uh, provide a lot, we have received a lot of RSA training grants. Um, I've been a PI of about, I think, 15 different grants over my nearly 40 years of uh, being here at Penn State. I'm that old. Um, and one of the things that I was kind of curious about is we know that they have that two year payback period. But I always wondered, like, well, what happens after the RSA scholar completes their initial? And it can, I realize it can be more years, depending on uh, how many years they they uh, receive support. But in general, about two years. And I was curious as to what happens to them. And uh, because right now, as you probably know, RSA does not collect data on uh, what happens after a RSA scholar uh, pays back their obligation. And so I, a number of years ago, about three, four years ago, I undertook uh, a pilot study of former RSA scholars from Penn State. And there were about 80 students over that time period. And there are a lot of different findings, but relevant to today, I'll just highlight one or two. Um, I had about 80 respondents, and about two thirds of those work for State VR. And one of the questions that I asked was, are you planning to stay or leave within the next year? And some of the descriptive data talking about um, if that was the case and why that was the case. But for today's presentation, I'll just focus on this. I found that 30 percent of of the uh, participants who worked in state VR indicated that they were going to leave within the year. Contrasted with 3% of non-state VR. Now again, it's pilot study, limited data, but to me that even that sort of stand out that the rate was like 10 times higher. What's going on? That began then this whole other larger study because this was just pilot. So I was interested, well, is that something just unique to Penn State? Or is this kind of a nationwide issue? And that was the start of the study. Next slide, please. 
So in the study, there are four research questions that we address. I'm only going to, today's presentation will focus on the last one, but the, the three research, the initial three research questions of the study was, first off, is there any kind of a tracking system that states use to monitor the long-term employment of former RSA scholars? And by that, I mean after they do the initial payback. Second question was, what factors contribute to why state voc rehab or why state voc rehab counselors intend to either leave or remain with the agency? The third question was, well, if they decide to leave, where do they go? And then the, the fourth question was, and the one that we're going to focus on this afternoon, is well, what strategies can be used to address the recruitment and retention of state voc rehab counselors? So those, those were the four research questions of the NIRA study. Again, we're just going to focus on number four. OK, next slide, please. Now, for, for those who, uh, and I see I have a, a couple rehab counselor educators here. If you're interested in, say, geez, I'd like to learn more about those first three questions. Well, by Cracky, we have good things for you. You can either look at the uh, report and I can send that to you. Um, we generated a 39 page report. It was distributed to all state VR directors. Um, and there's also included in there a two page executive summary. Um, uh, for the academics in the audience, there is also an article that we published recently in the Journal of Rehabilitation <coughs> called Recruitment and Retention of State Vocational Rehab Counselors, a Mixed Methods Analysis. And again, that was in the Journal of Rehabilitation, Volume 89, Issue 1, page 61 to 71. So if you want, more information on the whole study. Look at that. Next slide, please, Madison. <clears throat> Carol mentioned that she and I did a couple podcasts this summer. And again, on the slide there, if you uh, go to the slide, you can uh, click the uh, headings and it will take you directly to those podcasts. And so on that slide is uh, if you want to get more information about that, I did two with Carol um, at George Washington and another with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So if you want more information, it's there. Next slide, Madison. OK, so let's get into the recruitment problems. OK, so let's, let's look at the first one. So big problem, well, that's why we're here. There's, there's, not a, there's an insufficient number of qualified applicants. All right, uh, that's a prevailing problem. Next, next problem. <clears throat> we also know, and I, I, I'll, I'll tell you in terms of this information, I should, I'll, again, I won't go into a great detail about the study, but basically we had done an online survey of state folk rehab executive directors. There are about 40 of them who participate in the survey, and that was followed up with interviews with 19 state folk rehab directors. So the information I'm sharing this afternoon is taken from that database. OK, so in my conversations with state directors and the survey, we learn like, yes, yeah, screening process takes too long. Sometimes it can be weeks, but oftentimes it can take months before a decision is made. And for the rehab counselor educators, we realize a lot of our students are going to be able to stick around after they graduate for two or three months waiting for a decision. So that's a big, big problem. Next problem. And this is something we have to take a look at. Some applicants don't understand what does a state VR counselor do? What are the job functions? What do they do? And um, I know that's something that in my own program at Penn State, constantly trying to help students understand because I think students have different perceptions about what does a state VR counselor do? OK, the fourth problem. <coughs> well, the fourth problem again, I don't think this is new news. I will have some new information, but this isn't new news. <coughs> Compensation levels, they're not competitive. So we know particularly within the last couple of years, students understand they have choice. And so there are a number of jobs that 
pay much better. So they have other opportunities. So this is a, a major problem. OK, next slide. So then the question is, all right, so given these kind of general problems, well, what can we do? OK, so the first thing that we look at is, OK, we have to expand job posting networks. Typically what happens is a state rehab agency, <coughs> pardon me, they'll use the internal um, network to disseminate information about jobs. Other social networks that exist, uh, ZipRecruiter, um, there are tons, not tons, but there are many uh, uh, services that are available to people to learn about jobs. And so one of the things that we need to think about is we need to broaden that. We need to broaden that network to get the to get the word out. Second thing we need to do is look at the job description. I realize as a state VR agency, you're precluded in standardizing information. And while that's good, when we look at that the job description, while we have to retain that standardization, the question is after reading that. Would that be something that a new, I'm not going to focus on the, the new counselors, would that be something that a new counselor would say, wow, that sounds really exciting. This, that, that's, that work sounds really something I would enjoy to do. Oftentimes they're, they're, it's, it's written in very kind of clinical, sterile language, not particularly enticing with people. So again, while you may be precluded from uh, how far you can deviate from the standard language. You have to think about well, what other kinds of information can we customize? So in that, one of the things that, that we're suggesting is think about well, what's unique about this office. Why would someone want to work in this particular office, in this particular town? So we, you have to think a little bit more creatively, if you will, about enticing a future counselor in looking into looking further into this job say hey is this something that i might want to do next reason next strategy <clears throat> big problem is reducing the bureaucracy associated with the hiring process we mentioned that this process can take easily weeks and oftentimes months and in talking with a couple state directors who've been somewhat successful in reducing this time period, one of the things that we learned, that a key factor was there was a designated person who basically kept vigilance over what's happening with these job openings. You know, are there any places where things are getting hung up that we didn't get information? We didn't get this report back or this background check or, or what's going on here? And like everything else, when you have relationships with other people, usually good, good relationships with other people, good things usually happen. And so get developing that relationship, a designated person with a human resource uh, individual within the state is often key in speeding up this process. And I have some other uh, thoughts. Uh, well, let's let's go to the next one, actually. Recognizing that that RSA, the RSA prob, uh, program um, generates a, depending on at least some of the recent data that I've seen, about 30% of applicants are coming from RSA scholars. <clears throat> one of the one of the big problems is that sometimes the job opening doesn't coincide with kind of the availability of students. Um, most students, at least at Penn State, in our two year program, most graduate in May, some graduate in August, and a few maybe even for various reasons might graduate in December. So recognizing that it takes two to three months, if that's the case, we need to think proactively. And so, one of the things you might be thinking about if you anticipate we're going to have an opening or we know someone's going to be retiring and leaving or leaving for other reasons if you can start that process around october 1st for the december graduate march 1st for the may graduate or june 1st for the august graduate you can be more proactive and then have better access to students when they're available 
The time to recruit the student is not the last week in April. Many students already have, have opportunities, so we need to start earlier than that process. Next strategy. Now, I'll just toot the horn a little bit for Pennsylvania. Uh, historically, although not now uh, in recent years, but historically Pennsylvania has allocated a portion of their staff training dollars for paid internships. I think based in my experience, I think that is like the number one recruitment strategy that entices students to pursue state folk rehab. I mean, can you imagine it's like you, you get you get a you get a uh, RSA scholarship and then in that second year, that last semester when you have to do your internship, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can get paid for that. That's a tremendous advantage, not only for the student, but also for you as the agency, because you have now months of data where you can determine whether or not, hey, is this somebody we want to hire? as opposed to just a, an hour, hour and a half of a job interview. So um, think about that as maybe a strategy that you might want to allocate part of your training dollars towards paid internship. I'll also mention that in Pennsylvania, which is very unique, uh, interns uh, had received paid medical benefits. So that's a pretty nice package to offer. OK, next slide, Madison. OK, so. Um, oh, uh, yep, sorry. What I, I said next slide, that's my mistake of it. Next strategy. The other thing is, and this is something for RSA to consider. You know, if you try to go just do a YouTube search and you did a day in the life of a rehab counselor, what do rehab counselors do? You'd be hard pressed to find any, I think, useful inner information that you could use from online sources about what does a state VR counselor use? <clears throat> In preparing this presentation, I uh, just tried to take the liberty to see if I could find such. Now, I'm not saying it's not out there. It may be out there. I wasn't able to find it. I did find, though, um, a link to, um, uh, it was a YouTube video. I think it was produced by I think it was uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, and it was about uh, a VR counselor. But again, that was someone who was working for VRC, I think as part of their uh, research and training center employment uh, project. That was the closest I could find, but it would be wonderful. I know CRC has something for, you know, as a, as a rehab counselor, but students and potential applicants need to be educated about why is this what's the deal with this job why is this a good job and it is a good job it's got problems but they need to have some uh, audio visual way where they can try to understand a little bit connect and if they want some information where can they go so i would personally love to see rsa allocate some funding for uh, public relations materials that they could enhance, develop, and maybe develop in some cases, or take a look at that we uh, universities could also use to students as well. OK, now next slide. So let's talk about what can you do in terms of when the applicant is actually there the day for the job interview, the on-site recruitment. OK, so here's one strategy. <clears throat> the first one is provide them with the opportunity to speak with counselors. Again, I know states typically they'll have like a panel, two or three people. They ask the same questions. It's all standardized and, and uh, you know, for, for various reasons, but also provide them with an opportunity to talk with people that are doing the job. And if possible, if you can match them with former alum, often that's a really nice connection. We have a lot of students that work at various district offices throughout Pennsylvania. And, you know, so when they, oh, you're, you're at Penn State, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is Herbert there? Oh, yeah, my God, that guy's been there forever since the first break. Unbelievable. So 
provide that kind of natural connection I think that exists. Give them that kind of opportunity. Next strategy. Look at the job tasks. And again, because of our effort to standardize and, and in fairness, and I get all that. But sometimes when you read that job description, it's just gobbledygook. Like, what is this? I don't understand kind of what, what's going on. So when you, um, if you um, have used the standard job, you might also on the day of the interview create sort of a more friendlier version of what does this job entail in plain language so that when the person leaves the interview, they have a clear understanding or at least they think they have a clear understanding of what is it that this job is all about. Next strategy. Now, here's something that's kind of unique. And you know, this is again something that we do in 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 rehabilitation practice, but many times we don't do it ourselves. And if you get to the point after interviewing, say you interview two or three applicants and you've decided applicant A is the one you would like to extend an offer, before you do that, you might want to extend an invitation for them to do a job shadowing for a day because, again, they're only there for like an hour, two hours, do an interview. But if you give them that opportunity to spend with another counselor, you know, to kind of really get a sense, hey, well, this is this is what it's like. Now, again, you might say, wow, you know, that's a lot of investment. That's, you know, that's going to take a day out of a counselor's time. And do I want somebody kind of following me? And well, here's the thing I would say to you on that aspect. Think of the cost that it that it takes to do that, to have a, a counselor or counselors allow some portion of their time to share and talk with a prospective uh, colleague versus hiring someone, providing the training, and then within the year or two, they leave. So the return of investment, I think, makes sense. And so that would be something I think certainly wealth worth your while in exploring. Next strategy. Pay is a big problem. I'll talk about that in, in, in a little bit. And while monetary value uh, sometimes uh, is, is kind of the all encompassing uh, criterion, uh, some states do also a nice job about explaining the benefits package and also what does that mean in terms of of dollars because when we look at it, say well your salary is forty five thousand, but when you add in terms of kind of the benefits and all the other things well that could add ten thousand dollars easy plus to the salary the other thing is is um and i'm mindful of time <laughs> um we have to kind of tailor that information by the generation uh, cohort. So younger uh, uh, employees are much more cognizant, and I'll talk about this in, the, in a couple slides, about this work uh, life balance. So we need to kind of keep that in perspective. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So um, when you look at, again, some additional on-site recruitment, <coughs> um, uh, oh, did it again. I was going to the next slide. I'm at the next strategy. Fine, let me just kind of say this. There, there's a two, I refer to it as a two decision rule here. The one decision is, do we want the person? Do we want this applicant? But the other decision is, do they want us? And I think some states do a good job in, in terms of marketing and recruiting themselves, and they get that. Others, not so much. And so we have to kind of think about like, well, really, how are we inviting them into this environment? Is this something that that you feel welcomed? You know, when you when they interact with you, is this, you know, like how what's the image? And hopefully it's an accurate image, but what's the image that we portray? So we just need to be cognizant of that is there's a lot of information that not only we're getting, but we're also sending out. So remember that kind of two decision. OK, Madison, next slide. So when we look at systemic recruitment strategies, well, the first one, the obvious one is let's look at the current salary structure and whether adjustments are made. Now, um, I'll talk about in the in the next slide about specific salaries, but suffice it to say, <coughs> while there are some states that do really good job, 
have, have done a good job in orchestrating salary increases. For states taking a look at improvement of salaries, a couple things that we would need to need to do. One is collecting data, anecdotal exit interview data. So, you know, boy, this year we've lost 25 counselors. And uh, as a result of conducting exit interviews, we found in 23 of those cases, the main reason was insufficient salary. That's important data that we need to collect and not just simply say, boy, our, 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 our counselors are underpaid. When we look at comparison, getting comparison data within the state of jobs that are similar to kind of what a, a state folk rehab counselor does, how does that how does that compare? Doing cost analysis studies of what does it take in terms of the replacement cost when we lose a counselor? What do those data say to us? And then the other last one I, I have is, is learn from other states what they did. Um, I, again, for brevity purposes, I'll just say like there are states, um, I think Kentucky, I think North Carolina come to mind that have successfully achieved, uh, you know, getting higher salaries for counselors. And this took months, years in some cases, but, you know, reaching out, what is it you did? How did that work? Next strategy, and again, this is something that seems pretty basic. I have, I use the term stay at home. One of the best recruitment tools that we have are, is right in front of us. How many times a state voc rehab counselors and you're working with a client and, um, you know, as you get to know that client, you think, you know, that person would be a really good rehab counselor. Um, and so the question is, how how much do we reach out? Um, you know, we don't need to recruit people that don't know the field. This is someone who's actual consumer of services and know that. So we need to do, I think, a more proactive approach in staying at home, staying in our own backyard and identifying people. OK, this last one I think is going to be a little bit controversial, but any of you know me realize, well, nothing new on that one. This one I refer to as the big enchilada. Recognizing that many states, it's like we just don't have the money or we're choosing not to invest that money in your, we have money, but we're going to invest in these others. OK, well, one strategy maybe is to rethink the work schedule and what I one idea that we were coming up with was consider a 32 hour work week. In other words, the same pay for less hours. Now, maybe some of you are saying, Jim, what are you smoking? Well, let's let's look at a couple things here. I already said to you that that I think one of the big differences in today's employees, unlike people of my generation, they want to they want a better work life balance. OK, and so as a result of that, um, while you know the job's important, it's not the all consuming thing that maybe we make it out to be. OK, um, the other thing too in doing this is like, well, we're losing people that can offer more salaries, but for some people you can say, you know, given the choice between earning another $10,000 if I decided to work for the VA or the community mental health program and working $10,000, receiving $10,000 $10, less, but working 32 hours a week, that might be something really important to me. The other thing too, I'll just, I have more information about that, but because of time, I'll just say this. You know, 100 years ago, Henry Ford, he wanted to change the workday from six days a week, 10 hours a day. That's when uh, people back in the early, uh, around you know, 1910 or so, that was the typical work schedule. Six days a week, 10 hours a day. And he thought, man, that, that just not, that's just not working. Uh, people are coming back, they're tired, accidents are going through the roof. People are tired. Why don't we rethink this? So he proposed that five day, eight hour, uh, eight hours a day schedule, which back then, I mean, that was unheard of. I mean, it, there's he's proposing a reduction of one third of the working hours. 
So before we start kind of like, well, we can't do that. Um, sometimes I like to ask my students before you get into that posture, why don't we just try to adopt this posture as what would it take to make that happen? So before we say we can't do it, let's just let's just make an assumption or try to get behind the perception of how can that happen? So um, I'd also in the panel, I'd be interested if there are any states that are exploring this option. I've heard through the grapevine there's one or two that are kind of thinking about this. I'd be interested. Next slide. So retention, other retention barriers. OK, we talked about the low salary, so. Uh, the you know, let's go the. First barrier, yeah, low salaries. So at the baccalaureate degree, it's about 42,000 at the master's. It's about 46,000 and at the master's supervisor with experience, it's about 55,000. So again, you know, uh, some of those strategies that we're talking about, you know, if we can address those, I think we can improve on that aspect, but that's not enough. Next barrier. Big problem is our, I know new students, master's level counselors, and particularly now that we've gone through the KCREP mental health kind of professional identity, the role of counselor and uh, developing and maintaining a therapeutic relationship for a lot of our students is what draws them into this field. And so when they're in a situation where they have limited client contact and more case service documentation, we're losing people. And related to that is the next barrier, caseloads are too high. So specialized caseloads might be averaging 30, but generalized general caseloads, some can be in the 200 plus or so. Related to that barrier is the next one about insufficient career opportunities. Uh, oftentimes, many states sort of like a you know, rehab counselor one, rehab counselor two, and then supervisor. Another barrier that we have are relationships, and particularly at the supervisory level. Um, we, we know that that's often a, a reason that contributes to why people leave. <coughs> and the other, <coughs> excuse me, the other barrier, the last one, is a lack of flexibility. There are a number of states that I would say are kind of adopting the mode of returning to the past, the good old days. I'm not, first off, I'm not sure they were so good old days. So by that, what I mean, I, I see things where states are trying to do away with telework. Um, they're asking our counselors to work at fixed schedules and fixed times. Those, so these six problems, we'll do the next slide, are contributing to why we're losing people. So what can we do about it? OK, well, the first thing we already talked about kind of strategies. Um, so, you know, in there, when we're talking about salary levels, and I, I mentioned some of the things that are kind of re related to recruitment in terms of salary are the same uh, in, in terms of retention. So I'm not going to go through all repeat basically what I said. But I'll just say to you that sometimes what states have been doing in trying to um, get uh, higher salaries for counselors is that they're tying promotions with uh, an increase of, of uh, percent of 26s that they might use. They're trying to look at the tiers that exist uh, between a counselor one, two, three, or four, and they may reduce the time. So rather than say it takes three years before you get to the next level well maybe we'll reduce that to two years they're creating specialty positions sometimes uh, there are states that are helping with maybe the um, eligibility determination and having counselors that are going to specifically help uh, you know looking at it you know at that a aspect <clears throat> the other another strategy is trying to provide counselors with greater contact so and this is where it's, you know, one problem kind of evolves into the other, because when you have more people leaving, that means your clients have to be covered by people are staying, which means their numbers are going up. So it's a vicious cycle that's happening. So if we can get a handle on getting some replacements and thereby reducing that level, uh, you know, that would help tremendously, you know, with that. Other states are looking at also questioning whether or not the uh, we need to work at the uh, super at the master's level and hiring baccalaureate people. 
Um, hey, Jim. Yeah, we're close. You're getting close. So you have about okay. three minutes. I see a okay. few slides left. I just wanted to let you know. All right, thank you. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, there we go. So in terms of other strategies, um, yeah, yeah, offering uh, counselors greater choice, flexible work schedules, telework, part time. We're losing a lot, you know, people, the uh, seasoned um, experienced counselors who retire, they retire and that's it. Well, uh, maybe, you know, we can invite them back for extending part time work or maybe even current counselors rather than losing a counselor say, well, is it possible we could retain you on a part time basis? OK, or, you know, and ask him in that way. Uh, let's go to let's just go ahead and put up all the strategies for that. Um, some states also what they're doing is hiring counselors specifically to cover temporary vacancies. So it's sort of the you know, kind of a stopgap measure. Um, and then when a lot of states collect stay and exit interview data to assess kind of their work climate, but we could learn from that in, in terms of kind of why they're leaving. And um, the important thing is we collect the data. We have to use the data. A lot of times data are being collected, but they're not being shared with the people that need to know it. Next slide. Um, I have in here the first strategy about like, you know, what what constitutes a high performance team? And there are a lot of things that we kind of already know, but you, it's one of these things that we kind of forget about the importance about relationships that we have with other people and how people are involved in the decision making process. And do we have a clear understanding about what we're doing and why we're doing it? The only thing I'll just mention that might be a little bit new and interesting down below, I have a five to one feedback ratio. In some of my work looking at leadership teams, one of the things we find is that effective leadership teams, one of the things are characterized by a ratio of five positive feedback uh, comments to every negative or corrective. Um, so something to think about. Let's finish up on this slide. I'm going to go to the next uh, strategy. The last thing I'll say on this slide is clinical supervision training. Um, this to me, this these folks I think are the most forgotten uh, group supervisors and yet we know from my research and other studies the role the relationship a counselor has with a supervisor not only improves counselor retention improves organizational culture but also improves client outcomes so if you have an effective supervisor that knows how to do good clinical supervision and by that I'm talking about how to be focusing on the client counselor relationship and how those dynamics play out to rehab outcome. That can be a tremendous uh, asset as well. Next slide. If we don't have it in place, think about developing a, 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 play, a planning team, three to five people. Let's let's take a look at this retention improvement. What are we doing about it? Another strategy what we can do is maybe think about designating a full time person that's sole job is all about recruitment and retention. So they may be responsible for doing the inter exit stay interviews. They're going to monitor the recruitment process of applicants. They're going to develop relationships. And I know some of our panelists will be talking about this with universities in terms of how we can improve that recruitment effort. And then they're going to also da collect data on the salary structure. My final slide is that if any of you are interested, um, we um, we're also now collecting data on state folk rehab counselors. Um, we have an online survey. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to complete. The link is on the slide. Participants get $25 e-gift cards and they can earn two CEUs towards CRC maintenance. And so with that, uh, let's take some questions. To enter your questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will make sure that they get to Dr. Herbert so he can answer those while we're on the call, while we've got them with us. There you go. What is your favorite color? No. no. <laughs> 
<laughs> also, Carol mentioned before Dr. Herbert's presentation about the podcast that he participated in, and there's also a training that he did with the Technical Assistance Center for Quality Employment. We're going to put those links directly in the chat for you, so you can check those out at your leisure if you want to learn a little bit more about this topic. Um, so be on the lookout for those. We'll set, we'll put them in there momentarily for you. And the other thing to get maybe some questions going into, I, I see a number of your or fellow rehab counselor educators. I'm curious about what is the message we're sending to students and what are the perceptions you think students have about state voc rehab? Because I think that's something we can do a better job with, but I'd be interested in any questions or thoughts that you have about this um as well jim you're stealing my panel stuff <laughs> okay go ahead go ahead carol no you're good see i was just going to put a link in because <laughs> as a result of jim's work we have been working with you know state vr agencies across the country and we've been collecting a lot of their recruitment and retention strategies they've been implementing so we developed on our vrtacqm.org website and i've got the link in there that'll take you directly to the page where we keep we just keep building this out because folks have been super energized and they're doing a lot of very cool things. And so we're trying to collect that in one spot so folks can have um, access to all of those various strategies that other agencies are using. So I did put that link in the chat. Cool. It doesn't appear that we have any questions. If, oh but my Lord right now but we will encourage you if you have questions for dr herbert you can email him directly at jth4 at psu.edu or you can send them throughout the conversation um, you can still enter them into the chat just let us know that it's for dr herbert and we can always circle back we did have a comment from tony that said we should endeavor to make sure students are not overly fed high caseload and bureaucracy aspects of the job I, yeah, I, I agree with you, uh, Tony, and I, I think the thing about that, as you can see, um, that you know th this is it's a complex problem, and it, and it and it involves a cooperation between the rehab educators, the state VR people, the leadership, you know, in, in terms of of uh, you know how we're addressing it, because we can't continue on this journey, this road. It's just you know it's it's not getting better; it's getting worse. And as they said, you know, if we keep doing the same things that we're doing, they expect different outcomes. We're living in fantasy land. I'm from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And one of the feedback that we got from students is when they go for a practicum and internship uh, placement interview, the process is pretty slow. And they had to wait for like two or three weeks before they got an offer. And at the time, they already got offered from somewhere else. Uh, so we have choices for students. At least they will apply to three sites and then they will decide which one they can or, or, or you know, people will give them offer and they can decide. So DVR usually is the last one and students get so anxious. Yeah. And they will just take what first come first, the first one that they got offered. You yeah, know, that, so that's the thank, issues too. Yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. And again, I would extend when we were talking about um, recruitment and I, I gave specific kinds of calendar dates that maybe we, when the job and that could also be extended to practice and internship. So if you know, for example, you know that students begin their their internship, I'll just say January 15th. We need to communicate with the state VR people. Hey, look, our students start looking at internships on November 1st. You need to be involved at that point. So we need to help them because they don't they don't understand what's our calendar, how that works. And, you know, so we need to and this is where I think our panelists will talk further about this. We need to develop. We need to kind of redevelop, if you will, or re uh, improve if you if you want to use that word on you know um making sure we're communicating so that our students if this is something they want to do realize wow you know i got an internship and not only that if i can offer pay that that's a big deal i mean i i had students that would have two or three internship opportunities but uh povr you know they they usually got the first crack because 
paid internship and benefits. Can't beat that. And as I always say, this is like if you want a, the first job in rehab, the best first job in rehab, in my opinion, hands down, work as a state VR counselor. But that's also a message that we as educators need to communicate because I think also if we're truthful, we don't always send out kind of like the positive message, you know, like what do students hear? So we got some responsibility in this too. Well, Jim, we've I got to cut you off, but we now Heather, I know, is going to get nervous at me because we're over schedule <laughs> over our time. But if we can, let's switch to our panelists and then we can see if we have a little last word that you can have at the end. Is that all right? Love it. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. All right. We have a great group of panelists. From Texas, joining us is Laura York, Program Specialist for Special Projects, the Texas Workforce Commission, VR Division. We have Dr. Linda Holloway, PhD, Department of Rehabilitation and Health Services. Professor Emirata, <laughs> Emirata um, University of North Texas. Georgia, we have Don Lewis, CRC, Career Center Director and RSA Project Manager, Thomas University. Jeff Allen, he is an MS, CRC, Director of Policy and Compliance, Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency, Brigham Gertz, MMHC, MRC, VRC, recent program graduate of Thomas University and is a VR counselor at Utah State Office of Voc Rehab. And then with Mississippi, we have Dr. Frank Giles, PhD, CRC professor and director, rehabilitation counseling program, Jackson State University, and last but not least, Rosie Gibson, director at the Addie McBride Rehabilitation Center for the Blind, Mississippi Department of Rehabilitation Services. So, so thanks panelists. I appreciate you all being here. I'm gonna start out with you, Laura, and I wanna dig right into what innovative strategies are you employing to address recruitment and retention challenges in your agency? Thanks, Carol. There, um, there are a number of the strategies that Dr. Herbert mentioned that um, Texas has begun to employ or is exploring. Um, but one that I really wanted to share with you today is a, a partnership that um, Dr. Holloway, Linda, and I have um, have created in um, an effort to. Um, create a pipeline of recruitment and retention between VR and our state universities. So we've got five universities who have rehabilitation programs. And so we started there um, about a year ago planning for an event that we've called a uh, VR and, and educator um, collaborative forum. Uh, so we've we've put together an event. And in fact, we are uh, in right smack in the middle of that today. Uh, so we've got everybody in rooms downstairs listening to John Connolly as we speak. Um, but we we were able to access at UNT a graduate um, marketing class. Um, they chose VR after we talked about what what VR looks like uh, as one of their. Uh, graduate projects and um, and really explored a number of strategies for um, recruitment and retention for um, students who were leaving um, programs and for even customers um, understanding who VR is in the community. Um, so they uh, they looked at our websites, they gave us feedback about uh, what what students might want to know, what uh, people in the community might want to know, how they might want to access it. Um, they created uh, uh, one pager kinds of infomercials, um, the use of QR codes and social media and a lot of the things that traditionally a VR agency hasn't done. Um, so it's been been great feedback for us to um, to be able to pull together and give uh, information to our university committee um, plan for planning this event. Um, we also talked to uh, our uh, current staff. We had um, some of the entrance um, interviews and stay interviews. Um, we've used that feedback. Um, 
we in our in our forum today, we've taken the opportunity to sort of um, educate each other. Um, VR has taken some time this morning talking about the the uh, national landscape of VR and the state landscape. Um, and then this afternoon, we have a panel of the educators who will talk about what it looks like in rehab programs across the state of Texas. Um, we have lots of VR staff here um, in, in partnership to uh, take a look at some models for some of the um, uh, agreements that we have with the universities across the state. And um, and then tomorrow we'll have focus groups that include both the universities and VR um, to create, uh, do some brainstorming, talk about what, what kinds of relationships can come out of this. And then um, we will have an action plan for next steps before everybody leaves. So uh, that's one of the things that, that we've got going and, and happening today. And uh, we're looking forward to finishing that out. Well, Laura, it sounds like you are a future podcast for sure. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I love, love it. I, mean, what you, I liked what you said, though, about talking about um, the landscape, because I found that is one of the things with our VR counselors and, and the field staff in general, understanding the why behind the what. Because we all know it, you know, as leaders and um, folks in the field, you know, out really close to these issues, those guys are boots on the ground. They don't always understand all this why behind the what. And it doesn't always make you like it better, but at least if you have an understanding of why you're doing these things, you you can accept it better instead of thinking these people have just created all this craziness and what are they, what are they doing? So I love that you are tackling that. Um, Jeff, I'm going to swing over to you to see, do you have anything you want to add to innovative strategies you're employing to address recruitment and retention in your yeah, state? Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Carol. So again, uh, as mentioned earlier, we, we've we implemented a lot of the things that Jim has talked about. Uh, one of the biggest ones probably being that we actually are doing paid internships. Uh, we're bringing them on actually as part-time employees. Uh, allowing them to work up to 29 hours a week, making sure they're getting what they need, and then offering them that ability to then move over into full-time employment once they graduate, as well as providing financial support for preparation for the CRCC and paying for the actual tests. Um, so, so to give them that, and then of course, once they receive their CRC, um, they get another pay increase because we have another scale for individuals that have the CRC. Um, that, those have been kind of the huge things. Uh, we also across our board have increased our salaries. And Jim, when I was listening to you earlier, um, you given your base, our CRCs are starting right around the 50 mark and our supervisors are coming in at about 70,000. Uh, so we so we really are trying to have that and be stay competitive, not only with our other sister agencies, but also um, the private entities as well. Um, so trying to have those, those things in place. Uh, and then of course, you also mentioned it, the career ladder. So of course, we've got the counselor one, two, and are about to implement a counselor three, which is somebody that may not be interested necessarily in direct supervision, but would like to be a mentor and provide that long-term expertise and knowledge to new counselors coming in the door um, that we've been looking at, not to mention our other, other uh, positions throughout the agency, such as like things under my team in the policy and compliance area. That is super smart. You know, supporting folks with those CRCs and as they go on, you know, they get their CRC, they get a bump at keeping them, um, to, you know, getting their continuing ed credits as they go along and all of that. Any way you can support that is really excellent. I always think about, we talk about getting family sustaining wages for our, our customers. We want them to be in careers and in family sustaining wages, but in many cases in our state, we don't have family sustaining wages for our counselors. They're also working, you know, they're pizza delivery people on the side, they're driving Uber, they're doing all these different things just to make ends meet. So good for you for making that happen there. Rosie, did you have anything you wanted to add from Mississippi's um, vantage point, what you guys are doing to address recruitment retention challenges? Um, one of the things that they have uh, put in place is um, teleworking two days a week um that um that, yeah, was, sure one, Steph, that was one of the that was one of the, oh wait a minute let me search okay there i am <laughs> there you are. but teleworking was a big thing um they did go into salary increases um but that that in and of itself didn't seem to make as much of an impact as they thought 
Um, one of the things that I wanted to propose was undergraduate majors that would that would do well as rehab counselors, uh, maybe having the agency to uh, get in on the front end of that and say, you know, have you thought about going into rehab uh, counseling for a master's degree, especially with the funding that you have that can pay for it? Uh, I always direct him to Dr. Giles because uh, he's he can speak to that better than I can, but I'm always kind of pushing him in that direction. Um, because um, uh, we are critically low. We're having to take some um, other majors as rehab counselors, and they do not stay. They get out faster than the ones who actually have majored in rehab counseling. Um, so we've got, we've got some work to do, uh, but I think uh, after hearing all of this today, there have been some wonderful ideas, and I want to propose them on up the line. Good for you, Rosie. You know, that teleworking, you can't say enough for it. During the pandemic, we all learned we could pivot. But yet, there are some states that are going back. They're like, oh, nope, we're not doing it anymore. You're back in the office five days a week, and they are losing people in droves. Mm -hmm. So I think you can't underscore the importance, and it does go to work-life balance and not spending, you know, two hours a day on the road driving to get into the office and all of that. So that that's good stuff. Good for you, Rosie. So... You talked a little bit about this, Rosie, too, but what, what does your agency do to market your jobs and pique that student interest and development to pursue a career in public VR with your agency? I'm going to ask you first, Rosie, do you have anything else you want to add to maybe that? Anything you guys are trying to do? Um, we do um, job fairs. We attend things like job fairs, um, and but we don't do a lot of career fairs which uh, I think is also a mistake, but I think that maybe with the severe shortage that there is, maybe uh, we'll look at that again, but um, job fairs is the main thing. Thank you. And Jeff, how about you? So yeah, uh, definitely like the job fairs and career fairs, trying to utilize social media marketing as well. Uh, we have a really strong communications team that's starting to get more things out through LinkedIn, but also utilizing other programs. And then also, I know I know we specifically are talking about students, but kind of piggybacking off of uh, uh, the whole building within, we have a role within our agency called a pre-employment specialist, and they can come in with a bachelor's degree. And we've had out of the, uh, uh, I think over the course of the past two years since we developed that, we've had 10 of those go on to become CRCs because they bid into, they, you know, they drank the sauce. They wanted to move on and continue to serve, but they wanted to move up in the ranks. And so we've had um, about 10 that have gone on to get their master's and then come back or continue to serve us, but in a rehabilitation counselor perspective too. Um, so that, that's just some of the things that we've done. I like that, drinking the sauce. <laughs> How about you, Laura? Did you have anything? Yeah, to learn to use the unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> um, happens every day. I I, I think um, we Texas is in in line with um, with uh, many of the solutions that you guys are talking about. I think um, the one thing that's been really important for us is that. Um, we never let go of our CSPD program. We've continued to have um, access to education. We pay for uh, master's degrees or courses to be able to um, be CRC eligible. We pay for the um, exam and CEUs and follow-up training. Um, we give people seven years to be able to do that. We figure um, new employees need a couple years to kind of settle down and and uh, figure out where uh, where they might want to go and some of those kinds of things. Um, and then um, one of the things that we find is that once people um, they commit to that kind of a timeline and that kind of um, education, they stay. And um, so I guess that's a, a good retention strategy as much as recruitment. Good stuff. So I know Jim talked about this too, about that building relationships. It's so critical between the universities and the VR community. So building those relationships between VR and university programs that support a degree in VR counseling is critical. So let's talk about the nature of your relationships in each of your states, how it got started, kind of what are those key elements contributing to the success? 
And I'd like to kick this first to Mississippi and, and, and start with Dr. Giles. Thank you. Uh, I'm Frank Giles. I'm an African-American male. I'm, uh, I've been a, a certified rehab counselor uh, for about 39 years. I've got black hair, um, a black jacket, blue shirt, and yellow tie. And um, actually, uh, Jackson State University Rehab Counseling Program started actually in 1972. And um, we've had a great relationship with the state agency. And um, matter of fact, now, uh, we went down to Natchez, three other faculty uh, at JSU to provide training for Rosie's staff. Um, I guess it's about a couple of, you know, three weeks ago. And so, you know, it was really for us to, to you know, assist, you know, in their training, as well as it gives us an opportunity to uh, recruit their employees into the program. We had about maybe, you know, 50 people there. And one of the things I do want to bring up is that uh, uh, in terms of we've had like uh, our last eight graduates of our program, the students come into the program and we talk about state agency. And of those eight, five of them actually got jobs with the agency before they graduated. You understand? Mm -hmm. And so that in itself, I think, says a lot in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of employment opportunities. And yes, we need to increase the salary because it's a real competitive world out there. And uh, not only do we have a relationship with Mississippi, we also uh, one of our program graduates, uh, Mr. Antonio Reed, he works with Texas uh, VR in Houston, and uh, he's a member of our advisory board. And, uh, and so he's been uh, you know, a virtual uh, recruiter of our students. And I believe they've hired probably somewhere between 12 or 13 uh, in terms of uh, in the uh, off of the Houston area office where he works over the last few years. And so we work hard uh, in Mississippi, you know, uh, you know, nobody's gonna, you know, come and save us. We gotta save ourselves, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And um, and basically a lot of our graduates are in management positions with the agency. And so obviously we, we've got to, you know, support the agency because we have a real serious problem in Mississippi in terms of people with disabilities. And so uh, we work with our graduates, we work with the agency. And uh, in terms of career fairs uh, back uh, in November of uh, 2022, uh, actually uh, the Mississippi Department of Rehab Services and, and Jackson State University actually had a career fair on campus. And um, so it's, again, this is an opportunity for MDRS to come over and you know meet with our students. And uh, as well as in terms of we, uh, there obviously everybody knows about the advisory board. So they are active members of our advisory board. And so we just really try to work together, you know, in terms of trying to make it a better situation for our people. Sounds good. Thank you for that. I'm gonna, Don, I'm gonna ask you this too. How about in Georgia? What are you guys doing about the relationship? and building that. Was that directed to me, Carol? It was directed to you. Well, would you repeat the question for me? I'm sorry. Yes, so building relationships between VR and the university programs that support a degree in vocational rehab counseling is critical. Uh -huh. So let's talk about the nature of your relationship, how it got started and key elements contributing to the success of that. Yeah, well, of course, our um, the RSA uh, scholarships are, of course, the keynote of our of our program at Thomas University. Um, and we have at any one time, we have two different grants from RSA. We're really proud of that. We've been a proud performer. Um, as I think you know, uh, and you put it on a note here someplace that I can't find, but um, you know, how, how do we build a waiting list of people anxious to get on an RSA scholarship? That kind of cuts right to the quick, doesn't it? Um, and how do we do that? 
I think that's um, it's a little bit uh, an aspect of the, you know, we're, we're a school of 20, 2,400 students. We're a real small college uh, in, in Thomas University. We have, we have about 280 people in our master's counseling program. So that's a pretty high percentage of our total students, which means we get kind of the university's attention and the leadership of the of university uh, really well. So that's a good platform for us to do the kind of recruiting we do. Um, when our when our people come into uh, when our people come into the 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 pro one, we have a very uh, a strong re undergraduate rehabilitation studies uh, a major at TU, which uh, is a another feeder group into the RSA scholarship program. Um, we just onboarded um, eight um, uh, new scholars here. We're doing that right now for January. So we have a total of 23 scholars on the two grants. That's kind of magnificent. I think it was in terms of our fully, our, our boat is full. We're like Noah's Ark. It's pretty much pretty <laughs> darn full. Um, we try to open the doors for a new group every, every uh, semester. And, you know, the recruiting for that, um, is a lot of different aspects to it. One, we have great partnerships with, with, uh, with we're, we're here in Georgia, so, you know, we're working off all the assets that Jeff was just talking about. I think four or five of our people got those paid internships because we were highly aware of them because we have such great communication. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I think it's a measure of the school's um, a commitment to it. You know, when we have uh, orientation for our new counseling students, when they come in and they don't know which direction they're going to go, that is the moment of demarcation where you've got to get somebody interested in rehabilitation or not. Um, the other at other points in there, they could take career development courses and whatnot and get kind of interested in it uh, through the back door. But you know, um, you know, at the orientation, I give a speech and and, and other people on the staff give a speech. At, what is rehabilitation counseling? What is that world of state VRs out there? What is it? And we always like to say. You know, think of it. We try to give them a scenario real quickly of what what is it, what is it like? Well, is it is it a fulfilling job? You know, is it a job that when you go home, do you feel good about having done the the work you did that day? And we we kind of like strike a a chord of you know you can see the success of your work in VR. Mental health counseling, you do a good job, that's wonderful. You do your best for somebody with a diagnosed problem, but you may never see them at the other end of the of the funnel. You're gonna be, do termination and maybe never see them again. In VR, you can always be tracking your um, your successful work with them. And that, and that pulls people in. And next thing you know, there we find ourselves having more people on the waiting list. So are having an active waiting list. We just onboard those eight people. That means our list is down to 12 now, uh, which is you. a pretty good number. And good uh, the school stands behind us on everything we do, I think is a good way to say that. So good for you. And we have people like Brigham that, uh, you know, tells everybody out in Utah what we do. So. Yes. So I know I need to get to these last two questions. So, Linda, I'm going to give you a minute to do your elevator speech here. When we prepared for this conversation, you had some really interesting perspectives. What would you like to communicate to our federal partners about some observations you have regarding this program? Well, and, and I'm glad to see some of my partners there. Jim and I wrote an article years ago about undergrad, and so I was glad to, to, to see that he was the keynote uh, speaker here today, you know, because we, we have, we only take about a third of our applicants for our graduate program. But what we're trying to do as we move toward KCREP more of the students are going towards mental health. And so we've discussed, you know, how we how to use our undergraduate program more. Uh, Jim and I both used to have undergraduate scholarships and those really help get people in, get them trained in rehab and then move. They were already hooked to move into the master. So I think that's kind of an opportunity. Uh, we're also trying to have conversations about changing that dialogue. You know, it's not you know, but you're not going to get rich in rehab. Well, nobody hardly gets rich anyway. So having the conversation about you can have a good, you can make a good living and have a great job and really impact people. Uh, so we try, we're trying to pair them up with some of our alumni who are really excited because we all have some who are not as excited. And so get them into our intro classes at the graduate level, you know, talking to them more about this idea of a career ramp 
not just a career ladder because a ramp is accessible. Uh, so trying to talk about, you know, as a career ramp, if you're an undergrad getting in, then, you know, you can work for a community rehab provider. You can be a, a, an RST. There's a lot of things you can do while you start working towards that master's degree. But the paid internships, I think, are critical. Um, and just, you know, trying to have an opportunity there to to help balance. I, I see some comments in the chat about, you know, well, the job doesn't really match. The environment doesn't match what we're really preparing counselors for. You know, we've also talked about 48 hour master's degree, having a, a, a an accelerated program that goes from undergrad to master's. It really focuses more on vocational rehab. So I think there's some opportunities to look at ways we can do things a little bit differently. Uh, but, you know, just with our partners here in Texas, we've we've done a lot to we just keep pushing it. I, I wrote a chapter, Jim, when I saw that, I wrote a chapter called The Day in the Life of a VR Counselor for an Allied Health book, you know, but nobody's ever read it. So, you know, <laughs> getting the, getting that word out and doing the videos in, in ways to reach that younger audience, I think we have some, some great opportunities. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for that. So, so Brigham, we're going to give you the last word as a grad student. What motivated you to pursue a career in the field of VR and how have you remained involved with your graduate program after completing your studies? Oh man, last word. Um, well, happy to, to be asked uh, to be on this panel. Um, and as I was mentioning before, I, I started as a VR counselor even before I um, before I started the master's program. I'm here at Utah VR. I started as a, a VR counselor in January of 2021. And from the very uh, beginning, from my interview for the position, it was communicated to me that, uh, A, I needed to, to get my master's in, in counseling, which I was very happy about, because that's one of the goals that I had at the time. Um, and that I needed to get the CRC, become licensed, and also that there was going to be funding that would help me to achieve that goal. Um, and that was very encouraging for me because up to that point, I was not sure how I was going to pay for this master's of counseling that I was hoping to get. So, um, and uh, I think I, I was applied for Thomas about six months later after I started and uh, I was started classes before the my first year was done. Um, so, and which means that basically I had to pay an internship from the very beginning. <laughs> you could say, I mean, I, I worked, I've been working 40 hours a week um, from, from the very beginning. So um, it's been, it's been awesome. I, I heard about Thomas University actually through another VR counselor in my district. Um, so kind of that grassroots, she had uh, started at a different university and then uh, transferred to Thomas University and liked it more. Um, for various reasons, and I think that I've kind of passed on the word to quite a few other counselors that um, for various uh, reasons that Don um, highlighted as well, that um, the, the faculty are committed, the, the entire university is committed to helping us be successful. Um, and so I've loved to be in contact with them. They're a, a fountain of information. They've had quite a few opportunities for me to, to speak and to um, talk about uh, being a VR counselor. And uh, I would actually, as I was just preparing for this panel, I wanted to take like 30 seconds and just say, um, I think that most of you work for the RSA. And I wanted to say thank you. I know you don't hear this probably from most of your, you don't get direct uh, feedback from your RSA grant re recipients, but thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, the, the opportunity for me to graduate without any student loan debt has been a huge relief uh, in, for me. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything. So I hope that thank answers you. your question, Carol. Yeah, that's awesome, Brigham. That was awesome. Wow, we need, to, thank you, we need to get this guy on a commercial for sure. <laughs> so I know we're kind of over time. And I'm really sorry, you guys. So Karina, I am. Thank you, panelists. Karina, I'm going to turn it back to you for a couple closing remarks. 
Thank you, Carol, and thank you to everyone who uh, participated today. Um, I want to just express my sincere gratitude to all of you for your active participation, today's insightful contributions, and your dedication to the field of vocational rehabilitation. Um, today, we've discussed the challenges of VR counselor recruitment and retention. We've explored innovative strategies to improve recruitment and retention, and we celebrated the profound impact of skilled VR counselors. We've recognized the importance of partnerships, shared responsibility, and the enduring legacy of the public VR program, but our work doesn't end here. In fact, it's just the beginning. Let's take the inspiration and knowledge we've gained today and translate it into action. So I have three challenges for you to consider. Collaborative initiatives, foster collaboration between state and tribal VR agencies, rehabilitation long-term training programs, and all stakeholders in the vocational rehabilitation field. By working together, we can develop and implement innovative solutions to attract and retain highly skilled VR counselors. Second, data-driven decision-making. Embrace data-driven decision-making. Collect and analyze your data to identify recruitment and retention trends and use it to develop innovative strategies for program success. And lastly, number three, advocacy and awareness. Advocate for the importance of vocational rehabilitation and the invaluable contributions of rehabilitation counselors. Raise awareness about the transformative power of this profession. So in closing, again, I just want to thank you all for your commitment to the mission of improving the lives of individuals with disabilities and enjoy the rest of your day. And let's carry the spirit of today's discussions into our work. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Karina. We're going to now turn it over to Steve Wooderson from CSABR to make some closing remarks from our partner. Good afternoon for the Beltway. Thank you for this absolutely delightful webinar. It's been a great experience. Uh, NCRTM, thanks for supporting us. RSA, thanks for your engagement and leadership. Uh, Jim, um, I always enjoy hearing and listening to you. I, I always walk away with a great deal of appreciation. And Carol, thanks for um, uh, facilitating the conversation as well. I do want to give a shout out to a couple of folks that uh, I don't believe they're on, but I want to be sure that they're aware that from a CSABR perspective, they have great engagement in this conversation. One is, of course, our own uh, John Conley, and I think he's uh, doing double duty right now. I think he's talking to the Texas folks as we speak. Uh, but we also have two uh, uh, activities going on within our infrastructure that particularly state VR agency folks, I want them to be aware of. One is that Kristen Mackey from Arizona, Chris Claus from Missouri, they are leading our Operations and Personnel Committee. They're doing a lot of work, intersects, Jim, with what you're doing, as you very well know, and they are really carrying the message on our first strategic priority, which happens to be recruiting your king. So uh, that is very much the work of their uh, of their committee. Most of those are individuals that are involved in looking for strategies and exchanging information at kind of a, a statewide national statewide and national level. And then secondly, I believe Joshua McAtee may be on. I think I saw his name earlier, but Joshua McAtee is the director of personnel or personnel manager, whatever the proper term is for our West Virginia agency. Joshua is facilitating our human resources professional network. And this is a group that is uh, from across the country and most of our uh, state agencies are involved. But this is down kind of at, the, at that level, really, uh, in, in looking for solutions. And Jim, you had offered many of those and others have as far as some of the strategies we're looking at. So I want to say thank you to them and the work that they're doing uh, as well. Uh, there are a lot of things that we are about. CSABR is looking to influence, facilitate, and support. That's our job, and uh, I would like to spend another hour on it, but Carol, I don't think you're going to let me. I think no, that's I'm it. I'm <laughs> so. But thank you for this wonderful presentation and having an opportunity to just kind of put a cap on it here at the end. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks again to our participants, and thanks for all of our panelists and Dr. Herbert. I just wanted to remind folks that this program is being recorded. It will be published on the NCRTM YouTube channel. 
definitely sign up for the NCRTM newsletter and you can follow them on X, which is formerly Twitter to stay up to date on all those happenings. And you can um, follow up with any emails to them at ncrtm at neweditions.net. So Heather, to you. Thanks again, everybody, for your attendance today. Um, if you have any questions or follow up, please don't don't hesitate to send them to that NCRTM inbox. Just want to give another thank you to the panelists, to Carol, to Jim. We really appreciate you and your time today. Many thanks to Karina for your support in coordinating all of this event. We, we appreciate you. Um, we are about to conclude today's event. Madison, can you change the slide, please? Uh, the National Clearinghouse of Rehabilitation Training Materials, NCRTM, is maintained by New Editions Consulting Incorporated and sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education Rehabilitation Services Administration, RSA, under contract number 9199021C0033. However, these contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the Department of Education and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. This concludes today's events. Recording will now stop.